So we have the recitation classrooms, but there won't be a recitation paper. We'll do office hours and we'll po play poker. I'll bring my poker stuff, we'll form some tables with actual playing cards and poker chips and we'll play. Thursday, there will be nothing. There will be no office hours, uh, I think. Uh, certainly no recitations and no uh, meetings. It's a reading day. But Thursday students are definitely encouraged to come to Wednesday hours. Try to match your time, if possible, because those classrooms are smaller. Uh, some of you will have to be standing in there because it's a class of 23 seats and already 18 are taken, okay? But whoever comes will we'll have some conversation about whatever math questions you have <coughs> and about poker. Next week, Wednesday, Thursday, there'll be exam review sessions. Those have the same format as the midterm review sessions. There'll be practice midterm May, practice, sorry, practice final A, practice final B. I'll do one of them, I think Wednesday evening. Uh, you're welcome to go to whichever one you like. There's some <coughs> seats numbers, I don't know how many seats. They, they try to get bigger, bigger rooms, but there's exams all over the campus, so the rooms are, are limited. And we may add some office hours next week. If people wanna, wanna talk about math, we'll add some office hours. If you have personal constraints, as in grade concerns, or you have to leave, or you have to stay, or you're getting an incomplete, or anything like that, directly talk to me via email. There's enough for office hours directly to me. And finally, and the most important, trace evaluations. That's where you evaluate the course and me and the TAs and the whole thing. Uh, this, I'm sure you got an email, right? Hands up, who's got the email? The trace, good. So you go there, log in, and there's some standard questions and some free forms. You can type whatever you want. Please do those things. If you don't think it's important for you, do it for me and the rest of the students who come after you. Be honest. Uh, I'm not asking you to write anything positive or negative. Write things as you see them, okay? Talk about the good things or the bad things. What would you like fixed? What you, uh, you know, think was great? What you think other students might have liked or not liked? Um, there are two things that we try to act on these teaching evaluations, uh, not so much in terms of promotions and salaries, uh, as more like how should this course change for the next year sort of thing. Uh, you, the course you're getting is the result of 10 iterations of, of these teaching evaluations. Now, there are some things particular for the annual section. The most obvious one, which is some people complained in the annual section, back to the first lecture, is was too hard. Okay? It's too hard. That's not an acceptable complaint in the annual section. It's a perfectly valid com co you know, complaint in the regular section, but that's the whole point of annual section, right? To be more hard. There's no bound on it. Uh, I think we try to do what, whatever was appropriate for the annual section by adding extras and try keeping track of the regular sections, but that's not something we're willing to change. The honor section has to be more mathematically oriented than the regular section. So you, you can still write anything you want. Uh, the other thing for the honors here, other than difficulty, is the topics. Uh, the comment, why did we learn about Catalan numbers if the exams don't have them? If I don't understand how Catalan number gonna help me create the next great iPhone game, okay? <coughs> That comment, while well, you can make it, of course, it's something that you can't really see until later on. You need to, uh, you know, probably graduate and then study some more, and then you'll see how some of these topics that may, may seem right now not directly relevant to your immediate life, your exam and your co-op and your other thing, might come into play later. People who are double majors with math in this room, I think understand better what I'm talking about. There be some things that you may ask legitimately for my grade. What he put me through that thing? Well, you'll see later. Okay. So you can still write anything you want in there, but those two things. Why is it harder? That's the whole purpose of it. And why do I learn things that I don't in my exam? That's again something by design. So please do those things. I think you have a, a week or so to uh, fill them up. And. Um, that being said, <coughs> let's talk more about probabilities. Um, 
a new type of probabilities. So here's what we're going to do first. <coughs> we're going to talk about Markov chains. We'll get a little later about what actually those chains are. But for now, I have a, I have a physical model, which we're going to call memory less random walk. Uh, and this applies to many, many problems in many domains. I'm describing the abstract model here, but you'll see very easily how it instantiates in physical models, physics, uh, computer science, uh, you know, geography, topology, traffic, you name it. Uh, the critical thing here is, you know, there's a random walk and there is the memory <laughs> spot. Um, so we have a physical model and we have, of course, the probabilities associated with it. A physical model consists in states and transitions. So the example I have here written on this paper, which is the most basic example, I have, uh, here's example one, uh, three pizza restaurants. Uh, they are Bertucci. I'm not sure Bertucci still exists in here. Um, margaritas. So I'm going to write it as here's the state B, here's the state M, and here's the state S. So those are the three restaurants where people can eat pizza. And um, so these are the states. Or eating a pizza into one of these places, that's a state. And then the transition. I'm going to call P from, say, um, B to B is the probability that a visitor um, or user, say, visits B after eating in other words, my next pizza is still in B. So probability of Bertucci to M is the probability that user visits M after um, eating at probability of B S probability that next pizza is <coughs> S after eating at B. So these three probabilities are in plain English the probability that if somebody eats a Bertucci pizza that's a done deal today, it's Bertucci, it's a known thing. What's the chance that if tomorrow I eat a pizza or whatever the next pizza is, I can, I can stay at Bertucci with probability, uh, say, 0 0.7. I'm gonna write it right here. I can uh, go at Margarita instead, right? That would be probability 0 0.2. Or I can eat the next pizza at Sato, that would be the probability 0 0.1. So those are the transitions between the states. Of course, this is not just three numbers, right? Uh, the first observation we make here is that the probability of B to B, uh, that let's write informally, B goes to B, plus the probability of B goes to M, that's B to M, plus the probability of B going to S, this three thing has to sum to one because that's the only three possibilities of somebody 
eating a pizza after they eat a beverage, right? But the matrix, it's bigger than that. The matrix is, we just wrote, what does it take to go from B to B, M, and S? So we say the 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. That's what we have. But we, once I'm in M, I could ask the same question. Once I eat the pizza in M, what's the chance of eating the next pizza in, in Margarita? Maybe I like it so much. Or what's the chance to move to B or to move to S after that? Those would be a different set of probabilities, right? So this in here is the distribution of transitions from B. Once I'm in B, where can I go? And my example is this pizza restaurants, three of them, but we'll see in a second there are many, many examples of how this works. Uh, let's say from M, I have a different transition probability, 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and uh, 0.1. This is the distribution of transitions from M. And from uh, S, I have 0.3, 0.2 and 0.5 distributions of transitions from S. So if I am to write them on my graph here, from M to go to B, it's a 0 0.3. From M to remain in M, to eat the next pizza in the same place, that's a 0 0.6. And from M to go to S, that's a 0 0.1. Now, if I eat pizza in here, in this restaurant, to go to B, the chance is 0 0.3. To uh, go to M, the chance is 0 0.2. And to remain in the same restaurant is 0 0.5. So these drawings with arrows here, it's exactly this matrix encoded in there. I have three states, in this case three restaurants. The visit or the state represent a user going eating a pizza in there. Now what's the chance that a particular user, or agent sometimes called in this problem, once I've eaten in here, that's a conditional, once I've eaten in here, what's the chance to move into another? So maybe a, a, better, a better definition here would be with bars to clearly indicate uh, conditionals. Let me see. So how, how the conditional should work in here? What's conditioned by what? So this in probability with conditional would be probability of going to B, <coughs> given that the last visit is B. This in here would be the probability of going to M, given that the last visit was in B. This in here is the probability of going to S, given that the last visit was B, so on and so forth, right? So the conditional is, given that I eaten here, was the chance to move to the next pizza. <coughs> so I have two critical observations about this. One is that this matrix we're going to call P, transition matrix. This, this uh, square matrix here. So P, the transition matrix, is fixed in stone. It does not change, ever. OK, so I'm assuming for my model that this probabilities never change. When somebody eats in B, the chance to move into M, it's fixed doesn't depend on anything else, it'd be something from the beginning. And the other thing that's critical here, it is what is memoryless? What does this refer to? Clearly, I think everybody can see what the random walk refers to. Uh, don't worry about the statistical definition of a random walk like in a network, although that's pretty close. What about the common sense English? What's a random walk? It's having a graph which is this, this, uh, this state, 
how a user ends up eating pizza, right? That, that, that looks like a random walk. When somebody starts in S, maybe the next pizza can be in B, the next pizza again in B, and again in B, and then maybe back in S, and maybe in M, so on and so forth. If you look at the particular states visited by an agent or a user in this graph, that forms a random walk. It's random because the transition properties are random. There's no way to tell for sure if I ate in S, where's my next pizza is gonna be until I actually go, because there is a chance of moving here, there's a chance of moving here, and a chance to stay there. So it forms a random walk in an informal, common sense way. Hands up, who's with me? Good. So I hope we get the random walk and the transition matrix, which is fixed. Now, what is memoryless referring to? Yes. Is it basically it only cares about the current state and the future state? Correct. Is how they count and they can pull that? Correct. Future state, aka the transition, right, only depends on the current state. This is an absolute critical property which makes this model a little bit too rigid. Like, is it really, really true? in reality, that the chance of eating a pizza in, say, suppose I eat a pizza in this particular place, Bertucci, right? Can I say that me, every time after I eat a pizza in Bertucci, the chance of moving to the other place is exactly the same and only depends on the fact that I eat in Bertucci, like there's no other factors? Reality comes into play, it, it can never be like that, right? I mean, there's always some additional other factors. Again, in reality. However, this makes it very easy mathematically to work with this. Right? The more you complicate statistical models to make it more real, you'll see that a lot in machine learning. The more mathematically difficult they get. <coughs> and it turns out that simple models like this one, which are not perfect, we can clearly see the chance of eating a pizza in other restaurants may depend on so many other factors in reality, turns out Simple models work quite well in approximation, like in, say, <coughs> classification or clustering or some other problems. It, it, uh, you cannot get 100% due to the nature of the problems anyway. So if I am to have an error of, say, 20%, these models could be pretty good, stay as a starting point. So in probabilities, there's always this trade-off of how much you want to complicate things to make it more realistic versus how much mathematically more challenge computation gets. In here, clearly there's a sacrifice on the side that let's keep it simple, even though it's not exactly reality, because the math as you're gonna see, it's gonna be much simpler than if we are to complicate it. So those are the two critical properties of Markov chains. The P has to be fixed, it will never change. And to apply this model to anything, we need this memoryless thing. Let me say, <coughs> given where I am right now, my next move is going to be that. Can somebody give me some other examples that fit this model, other than pizza, restaurants, and movies? What seems to be this kind of uh, okay? I have a, I have these states, and it seems like the probabilities between them look rather fixed and rather memoryless, as in it doesn't depend on the whole history. Let me say one more thing. In reality, in life, <coughs> what happens next depends to some degree on a long history of things. Take about the chance of getting, say, a disease like heart disease. It's very unlikely that to depend on just the last thing you did or the, that day. It's probably something that accumulated over the time, right? <laughs> uh, success in a corporation, you know, like how, how, how high can you go with promotions and that. It's probably much more of a, of, a, of a result of an evolution over time than an exact thing that happened, right? Uh, same thing goes with marriage or kids' education or whatever. It's not, the next thing that happens is not the result only on the last state. It's more like a, a history-based evolution, not to mention politics or, say, military success. But there are some things that are more memoryless. They depend more on what's happening yesterday and doesn't matter the rest of the history. You're the second one. You wanted to say an example? Yeah, like sidewalk signs, when you can walk and when you cannot walk, based on when somebody's pressed a button or there's traffic moving. 
Okay, so traffic, uh, side, the light, right, you say? That is to say, depending on the state of the light, whether I can go or not. Uh, I, I agree with the memoryless part. I'm not sure how probabilistic this is. This, this seems to not be very probabilistic, as in I expect people who are in there and the light sign is on, they probably 100% gonna cross the street, or very high chance probability for that to happen. Yes? Um, when you're playing a game of rock, paper, scissors, so game? like the choice you make. Rock, paper, scissors, uh, choices. Yeah. By the way, games are great examples of this. Even very complicated games are implemented memoryless. Or they have two things. They have the memoryless strategy, things like StarCraft. Warcraft, hands up. All right, be honest. <laughs> how many people play? Like, uh, how many classes I've missed in high school playing StarCraft? <laughs> I remember that, right? Those games have two things. They have a memoryless structure, as in the decision is the computer makes depends on the current state of the game evaluation. And they have uh, some sort of uh, meta learning thing, like some games, not StarCraft, but that's all, but they have a understanding the behavior overall of time, but that, that's more like a prior. It doesn't, in, it's not embedded directly into the calculation. Most of these games determine what to do based on the current state alone. Given where we are, the, the current state could be extremely complicated. There's, you know, uh, some buildings, and there's workers, and there's resources, and there's whatever else it's in StarCraft, right? And then what should we do now? What else? Since I'm at games, can I put chess in here? Can chess be by a computer? Humans, you know, they're very creative. Humans sometimes play bluffing or whatever, but a computer in chess can make an informative decision based on the current state of the board, independent on how we got there. I think it can, right? A computer definitely can look at the board and say, it doesn't matter how I got here, it matters that I am here, and from here I have a certain chance to do, you know, uh, uh, that move or that move or final approach or whatever it is. What else? Yes? Like a water cycle. Water or cycle? Like water going into clouds and then into lake. Weather. <laughs> water cycle. Okay. Or other patterns like current in the oceans, uh, may, maybe like that. Again, this is a simplifying assumption. In reality, you can't expect a complex behavior like the weather. We don't even understand weather that well, right? Like even the, the, the weather scientists. You can't expect something so complex to be purely the result of what happens today. I mean, what if the planet movement of the sun influenced the weather, right? Which is true. It's, it's too complex, but you can approximate it with this kind of model, right? I mean, given the state today, we can predict quite well what's going to happen tomorrow, for example, in the weather. Yes? <coughs> Speech, text, text suggestion, right? <coughs> Speech, text suggestions. As in completion, right? Yeah. Or even corrections. The, the, the way computers or phones or tablets suggest this is the next word you want, or this is probably the correction to the word you just typed. <coughs> could be done probably with high accuracy based on the current state of things, given what you type. I don't need to know who you are. I don't need to know uh, what your experience was before or what other text you write before. I can probably look at the piece of text as written, independent of who wrote it and for what purpose, and suggest a correction or the next word, right? Most often, if I have three, four words, I can guess with high probability what the next word might be, independent of who wrote that, right? What else? How about dice games? Versus card games. <coughs> say, um, I don't know, blackjack or something like this. Can, can I say that card <coughs> games are memoryless? If you, if, you, if you know 21 of blackjack, if you have a basic idea of how it works, right? It has to do with what cards you've seen before a lot. What cards you've seen are critical 
for what to make of the probability of, of the, you know, the next cut coming up. Can I say that's memoryless or can be implemented memoryless? Why not? The cards I've seen have a big impact to probabilities. How about in die games where I roll a die and uh, based on, say, Monopoly, right? Based on whatever die face come up, I'm going to do some move. Can I say that's memoryless? In the sense of it depends on the die roll, of course, and the state of the game. There's no history to be accounted for. Yes. As in almost no history. No. History is important. Uh, what else? Maybe you have like some kind of dice game where one player plays one, like eleven dollars in a specific situation, and everyone pays the other like two to the something back, and they have you know maybe probability of money. Exchange. Right. All these games have no memory. Whatever's going to happen in the next game depends on the fee and the roll of die. It doesn't matter what happens so far in the game. Right. That's included in there. Did you solve that problem? Oh, I would. <laughs> okay. Um, I have other examples here. Uh, you know, a lot of what happens with buses, say, or bicycles or traffic, that has been mentioned. Brownian motions in physics, a lot of it can be predicted given the current state of things. Although in physics, current state of things is a vague notion. Once you go to that level of atomicity, like particles, the current state is not deterministic. You can measure statistics information about it, but you can't say for sure where the particle was or what its mass was or something like that. It's like approximative. But given that approximation of current state of things, Brownian motion, which is gas hitting uh, solids, typically, you know, gas in a, in, a, in a mass of solid or liquids or heavier liquids, uh, that can be modeled with Markov chains. Yes? I'm just wondering, uh, to what extent can you say uh, state is like current? Because, for example, in the game of cards, can you just see the cards that have that were uh, given up before as like an array of like values and that's like a specific state. Right, right. It, it, that I can model cards like that, of course. What he's saying is instead of observing the current states, which are only few, right, I make the states the whole history. And then if I do it like that, what's the disadvantage? Obviously, my next action or reward will depend on those states and the probabilities. Clearly, that works. The disadvantage of doing such a thing is that history will be a lot of states. Right? I mean, how many possible states are even in simple games there? Right? I mean, the number of states will be so gigantic that that would be too hard to, to model. Right? In chess, even the boards, the current states of the board are a lot of possible states. If you are to include all the possible ways to get to a board, it will be you know, 10 to the 20s probably range. Um, so a lot of examples have this, this, this particular feeling that history matters less. I wouldn't say zero, but matters less than the current state once you know where you are. And some diseases work like that, by the way. It is true that to get to a disease, usually human body have a lot of you know, gray area. Like, but once you get to it, once you clearly have it and you are in a certain stage, from there on it becomes more memoryless. As in, you know, diabetes type 3, at some point, it evolves. Uh, so with medicine, pre that's why preventive is so important. While, while you are in a state of not being sick, you can do a lot of things to change that. It's not memoryless. But once you get some chronic disease, uh, then it, it's clear that with a certain probability, some evolution is going to happen. Uh, there's some other example here that have been mentioned, uh, whether uh, I'm going to put here the web graph. Navigation. Can I say that about the web? What would be the, the states in the web graph? What are those? The sites that you're on. There'll be what? The site that you're on. The pages. And the transition will be once I'm in this particular page, what's the chance of moving to another page? As it so happens, there's a natural link between pages, right? There's a HTTP links. So presumably most users that move from one page to another page, they actually click on that link to go there. 
So we'll talk about this in the context of page rank algorithm, which is developed by Google 1998, uh, how that works. It's very close to a Markov chain. Now, what do we want to do here? This is the static part. This is what, you know, here it is. Restaurants, transitions. Now, I want to measure uh, the distribution of agents or users in the model. So here's what I mean by that. I'm going to say at k equals 0 step, uh, let's call that init. I have many, many users. So let's say I have n 10 to the 9 users. Oh, that's too many because we're in Boston. So let's say it's 10 to the 6, something like that. Maybe not that many people eat pizza, but let's say they do, right? Uh, and initially, I'm going to say, here's who's this, uh, this I'm going to call this pi, pi b uh, is the percentage of users eating pizza at Bertucci day k equals zero. And then similarly, of course, I'm going to have pi uh, m and pi s. And this is pi b. I'm going to put a zero here to indicate k equals zero. That's the initial step. Um, and I'm going to say this is a distribution of users. And it has to sum to 1, right? These three values. Uh, maybe because it's initial, we can assume uniform. It turns out, even if we assume uniform, it won't make a big difference in terms of modeling later on. Even though uniform is not true, say Bertucci is a more popular pizza place, we can uh, start with a uniform distribution. Now, what's the physical uh, modeling behind this math here? Is that I literally look at this a million people, and I say, day zero, they all come to Boston. Uh, where are those people eating? Like, what place they go? <coughs> say, maybe they don't know anything about those restaurants, they pick at random, one third goes there, one third goes to M, one third goes to S, right? I mean, as an assumption. <coughs> That's my initial distribution. It doesn't have to be uniform. I can start with a better prior distribution. Maybe I just start measuring this in Boston, and but I have some pre-prior experience in, say, New York. So I can use that experience as a prior to say, OK, I think initially I should start with Bertucci being more than a third. The other way to think physically about this is not with a million users, is with one user. Say me. What's the chance to go eat at Bertucci, Margarita, or Sado, right? It's say initially, I haven't eaten in those places. I have no information. I don't know which one has better pizza. I'm going to say there's a chance of one third, one third, one third, right? If you go to a new place, and you see like, okay, I'm hungry, I want to eat, there's five places to eat, you don't know anything about it, suppose there's no reviews, or suppose they all have equal reviews, you're going to pick one at random, right? But eventually, once you start eating in those places, right, you're going to develop a preference for some more than others. And for transition, maybe after I eat Chinese, I don't want to eat Chinese again the next day, right? Or something like that. Or after I eat Mexican food, I prefer to eat this other place, whatever. So that's one way. The other alternative view is one user, which is probabilistic. So in other words, pi b uh, will be probability of user visits b. And pi m will be probability user visits and so on and so forth. A zero, again, indicates 
is not an exponent, it indicates that's initially. So, like with most probabilities, we can visualize this in two ways. Either I look at the big poll of users or agents, say I have a million, how many of them go to each place, or I pick one user to say probabilistically, what's the chance of going there and there and there? So how transition works? I'm gonna go by this interpretation, not by this one here. I wanna say, I wanna move to k equal one. So once everybody eat pizza once, where are they gonna eat the next time? That's what I wanna calculate. So I wanna calculate P for Bertucci, what percentage of users gonna eat pizza in Bertucci, <coughs> but not at step zero, but at step one. So this is percentage of users eating at B in day K equal one. So I'm looking at this and say, who's gonna eat here the next day? How many? I'm not gonna say who exactly, but how many? How can I calculate who's gonna eat here? I'm gonna split this into a sum of three things. Is all the people, or percentage of, who ate previously at Bertucci, out of those people, so here's what happened at day, This is the previous day. This is so many people that ate the previous day, because it's zero, at Bertucci, at Margherita, and at Sato. How many of those people would go to Bertucci now? They ate at Bertucci yesterday. How many of them will stay at Bertucci and eat there? So what do I do? <coughs> what? <coughs> Let's say multiply. Is that clear what I mean here? Out of all the people who ate at Bertucci, the, the, the current state, the state before, again, it's memoryless, so I only care about the previous state. Beyond the previous state, doesn't matter. 70% of them will stay at Bertucci, right? Is that, is that the point seven that's coming from here? Right. How about the people who ate at Margarita before? How many of them will go at Bertucci now? 0.3, and the people that eat at Sato, how many of them will go to Bertucci now? How many? So let's put some arrows indicating what those things are. So this is previous day, k equals zero, Bertucci. This is the transition from B to B, right? That's what those, those, those numbers are. This is the previous day, at Margherita times the transition Margherita to Bertucci and this is the previous day at Sato times the transition from Sato to Bertucci. Hands up who's with me. Is, why is this a sum rule? <coughs> why is that the percentage of people or count is that plus that plus that? Yes, all the way in the back. Because people only eat at one pizza place. <coughs> so like, the people who ate at Bertucci's only, on day zero, only ate at Bertucci's. And the people who ate at Margarita's on day zero, only ate at Margarita's. Like right, so there's no overlap. All those users who ate before at Bertucci, some of them will go to stay to Bertucci, that's this number, some of them will move somewhere else. But between those and those, there's no overlap. Those are the people who previous day ate at Margarita, then none in here common to the one who ate at Bertucci, right? So that's why all the people coming from Bertucci back to Bertucci are all different from the ones that were yesterday at Margarita. There can't be any overlap between these groups. So that's why it adds up. And the other observation here is that these three values, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, they don't sum to one. Where are those three values in here, in this matrix? Those, those transition probabilities to end up in Bertucci, where are they? 
this is the people who gonna the, the transitions to end up in Bertucci from various places. This don't sum to one. Who sums to one in this matrix? All the rows. Out of the people who are at Bertucci yesterday, here's the percentages of moving around. They have to sum to one because these are all the people Bertucci. But the people who come to Bertucci the next day, there's no reason for those probabilities to sum to one. So this row sum to one, but not the columns here. Good. So can I say the same about uh, the other? This is just one value. I have also, I have to compute probability of now being in Margarita at step one. Who's this going to be? Who's going to end up in Margarita the second day? Well, there'll be some people that eat at Bertucci the previous day. How many of them move to Margarita? I'm going to write it as probability. Probability of? M given B, or how I wrote it there is B and M, right, in the matrix. Plus, where else people can come to Margarita? Well, they can, maybe they ate a Margarita before, and then there's a transition probability to move to, to stay. And finally, maybe the previous day is at Sato times the probability of uh, moving from Sat uh, to Margarita from Sat. Right? This is the same exact equation written for M instead of B. So I, run the, I want to write this as a vector. I'm going to say if my vector pi 1 is actually a, a vector like this, is pi 1 uh, B, three values, pi 1 M and pi 1 S, so I wrote pi 1. Sometimes people put a bar to indicate that's a vector as opposed to just a value. A vector is really an array of values. If you do a little bit of linear algebra, you get vectors and matrices, right? The vector is a matrix that has, say, three rows and one column. So some people in math, modern math, doesn't put bars. They rather write it in bold. So when you see a normal written variable, that's a value or a scalar. When you see a bold variable, like a big pi, that's typically a vector. So can I say pi 1 is really p, that is this whole matrix, time pi 0? With those three, I miss one. This is the one from m. I have another one for s, right? Pi 1 s is pi 0 b times the probability of s given b plus pi 0 uh, M times the probability of S given M plus pi zero S times the probability S given S. So those three equations, one for Bertucci at day one, one for Margarita at day one, can I write it in a in a in a vectorial form? So what I want to say, this is really the matrix P. That is 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0. What's that? 0 0.6? Yeah. 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, and 0.5 times my initial vector, which was pi 0 b, pi 0 m, and pi 0 s. Can I write these three equations instead of writing them explicitly like big forms? In a matrix form, do you guys know how the matrices multiply? That's effectively what this comes down to. Right? It's this times this. Is it going to work? Well, let's see. This equation is multiplying P0B, P0M, P0S, those would be those in here, times what coefficients? 0, 7, 0, 3, 0, 3. Is that how the math, math multiplication works? How, how does this work, the matrix multiplication? Yes. Uh, so you take the first row of the matrix. Yeah. And then I guess we multiply with the column. Yeah. But would I get that? Well, you multiply the first item of the first row times the first row of that column vector, yeah. 0.7 times 
Bertucci's original nice. probability, so it works there. And then? And then the next guy, we're looking at... What I'm asking here, if I do this operation, do I get those three equations? How does it work? Isn't it the first row times the column, like one by one in additions? And then the second row, yes. that should be M, right? The second row, 361 times this column. Is that this equation? It's close, right? I mean, I, I, I have a feeling here that I'm close to what I want, but it's not, it just doesn't work. <coughs> so what do I need to do to make it work? Switch the rows and columns. Uh, if I, you say permute this thing, so what would it be? This is point three, point three. What is this one here? Point three. Uh, three. Uh, is that right? Uh, point two. Yeah. Point six. Yeah. And point two. Two. And the last one would be? Point one, point one. Point one, point one, point. How much? Five. Point five. Point five. Point five. Is that now going to work? Is that the first row in here times this going to give me this vector? And then the second row times this is going to give me this vector? And the third row times this? I mean, we really need to know matrix multiplication to do this right, right? So who's this? It's not P. How do we call this? P transpose. P transpose. That's, of course, a matter of how I set up P. Like, if I really wanted to have this P, I could have organized P that way to start with, right? I mean, I mean, instead of writing it this way, I could have wrote the transition probabilities the other way to get that P to start with. This is not a big deal because P is up to me to define. I could have defined P this way and then have it P in here, don't have to transpose it. But still, I need to know a little bit of linear algebra to do this correctly because it's easy to get the wrong multiplications here, like I just did on the board. Okay? But more importantly, do we all see how those three equations are exactly this matrix form? So in other words, whatever probability of user density, distribution of user at restaurants was in day zero, the day one will be governed by that distribution times the fixed stationary matrix. This matrix, remember, doesn't change. But pi will change, right? This pi zero will not be the same as pi one. Meaning day one, I'm not gonna have a uniform distribution. Even if I start with a uniform distribution, right? If I do one, three, one, three, one, three, initially, there's no prior. Once I multiply with this matrix, I'm not gonna get one, three, one, three, one, three. Which restaurant thinks to be the most popular? Bertucci, because itself has a higher retainance uh, rate, right? And the transition rate, 0.3 from other ones, it's bigger than the transition from Bertucci to the other ones. So overall, I'm expecting that more people will go Bertucci long term if these probabilities hold, right? Okay. Is this true in general? Is this true that pi k plus one vector is really P transpose times pi k vector. Like this equation holds not just for day zero and day one. It's in general. If I know the distribution at day k, next k plus one distribution of users eating pizza those three places is going to be exactly the matrix times pi, the previous pi. Because the whole reasoning that I did here from day zero to day one, it applies just the same from day one to day two, or day two to day three, or day 99 to day 100, so on and so forth. Of course, this distribution will change of users. But whatever it is, the next distribution will follow these three equations, which is exactly this model here. So if this is true, then I think I can say uh, pi k <coughs> in general, it's going to be this matrix at power k times pi zero, right? Because think about what happened. It's like in those recurrence formulas. Every time you want to move to the next day, you multiply on the left with another p, which is fixed. 
So after three days, it will be pi zero times one p times p times p. After five days, it will be the initial pi zero times five p's, right? And after next day, six day, will be multiplying with another transition matrix, so on and so forth. So after a hundred days, who's going to be my distribution? It's going to be the initial distribution. Times p at whatever transpose at the power 100. Because it seems like every transition to change that distribution of users, I multiply all this matrix p. OK? So let me see here if I have a. Um, so the next thing that we want. Once we understand how this model goes, we want um, um, stationary distribution. Sometimes it's called pi. That's a vector because it's for a distribution. It's the probability is over all states. Or sometimes it's called you'll see in some books it's called pi star. So stationary distribution. It's kind of the long-term visit rate. We can say it's limit. It's this distribution that, uh, like before, it's a, this is a pi b and a pi uh, m and a pi s. It, it has three values. This is my pi uh, bar. It's a vector. It has the property, the property that if I multiply my transition with it, it's not changing. So it's a, it's a convergence, limit of convergence. What is this in English? So I have my three restaurants, Bertucci, Margherita, and Sado. I started with a uniform distribution, right? I don't, nobody ate at those pizza places before. There's no preference. I have a million users, they go one third, one third, one third. Day one, they start having preferences, right? Whoever eats at Bertucci has a 70% chance to eat there again, and 20% to move to Margarita, but whoever eats at Sato has a different percentages to move around. That's day one. Now once I have day one, they again multiply with P to go to day two, and day three, and day four. Eventually, what's gonna happen? These rates are gonna converge. I'm going to say eventually there will be a certain percentage of users who eat at Bertucci, a certain percentage who eat at Margarita, a certain percentage who eat at Sato. And those percentages will not change that much from day to day. In other words, this whole process becomes convergent to some sort of, if you want to call it for pizza, preference rates. How many people, our percentage, prefer Bertucci to Margarita? So eventually I say if you keep doing this, uh, they're going to have a stationary limit that's not changing. So they're saying pi star distribution is not changed from k to k plus 1. When I do the transition uh, you know, change, I get the same distribution. By the way, what happens to my distribution? If I, if I do this, that's my transition equation, right? I get pi k, multiply this. Is pi k plus 1 going to be a distribution here? I guess it's a check. Am I off the rails here or not? Like, this was a distribution, meaning what? It's three values. Do what? So this pi 0 initially has what property to be a distribution? Yes. Yes. One. Sum to one. When I when I multiply this to this uh, to this matrix, either one third one sort or any other distribution, the values I'm getting are they going to sum to one? Is it guaranteed? So in other words. If I look at these three equations that I have here, this is the new Bertucci percentage, this is a new Margarita percentage, this is a new Sato percentage. If I sum up these three values, day one now, are they gonna sum to one? Yeah. 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 Right. So let's, let's think about that for, for a little bit before we move on. 
I, I want to make sure we're, we are not, again, off the rails because they have to be a distribution without renormalization or other things. If I take these values, right, I have P, uh, K plus one, B is P. It's P, K, B times P of uh, B given B plus P, K, B times P of uh, B given M, I guess that's M, plus P, K, S times uh, probability of B given S. Huh? If I write the, all, all of them here, all three of them say, I have pi k plus one m and pi k plus one s. <coughs> if I sum it up, k plus one b plus k plus one m plus k plus one s, this is gonna be a constant factor in this column. Everybody's gonna have a pi b k, right? So this is gonna be pi b k times who? Probability of going B given B plus probability of going M given B plus probability of going S given B plus pi K M times probability of B given <coughs> M M given M and S given M there's another term in there. The point is those three probabilities will sum to one. They are row in the column. So the whole thing here is just this, pi kb, pi km, pi ks. Those were a distribution before they be at day k, so they're going to sum to one. In other words, the sum doesn't change. The sum of the thing is still going to be one. So now, back to my stationary distribution, I claim that this is going to converge. Eventually, there will be a stationary rate of how many percentage it at Bertucci, Margherita, and Sato. So how can I uh, solve that? I want to put my hands on this stationary distribution. It's just a distribution array of values, but how do I calculate it? Well, I solve this system, right? This is a system of equations that says effectively what? This pi b has to be uh, pi b plus p of b b plus pi um, m of p of uh, b m, I think. This 0 0.3 is this one here. Plus pi s times p uh, b s. Then I get pi m is pi b times pi m b here the b m I think this is m b so this value here zero point three that's P, B, M, this has to be M, B, uh, plus pi M of P, M, M, plus pi S on P, M, S, and the last one, So who are the unknowns and who are the known things in here? All these p are <coughs> coefficients, right? Known. And the unknowns are pi b, pi m, pi s. Those are the unknowns. So this is really a three by three system of equations.
This, however, cannot be solved in this form. There's a problem with it. So everybody sees what I've got. This, if I want a stationary distribution, it has to satisfy this equation. Once I multiply that distribution with a matrix, transition matrix P, I have to get the same distribution. So I wrote that down explicitly. Well, what are the variables, pi's, that have to satisfy this thing in here? They have to satisfy these equations. And I'm saying this system is insufficient for people who know linear algebra. That means what? When I have a problem solving a system, what's the first thing I need to do with a linear 3 by 3 system? When it has no solution or when there's a problem with it. Yes? The what? No. How do we solve a 3 by 3 system? Well, you can do the substitution method or we can. Yes. Yes. Uh, can you introduce the constraints that they have to sum to one? Right. I can solve this with substitution. It's a three by three system where, where the, the variables, these are the coefficients that are known, and the pi's are the variables that I have to solve for. But in general, how can I solve a linear system? That is, by the way, a linear system is something like x equal uh, what? A times b. Actually, what do I have here? <coughs> pi equal p times pi. Uh, it's not really a linear system. Before I get to you, how can I make this a linear system? Can I move pi on the other side? Yeah. So I get 0 equal what? Pi minus identity, right? Times pi. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the obvious solution to this system? Remember, p is a fixed matrix. i is the identity matrix. Everybody knows i? It's 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, right? The identity matrix. So what obvious solution pi can I fit in that will make this work, right? Pi equals 0 is not a solution. Yes. I'm confused you, you want now. to say, huh? I'm confused now. All right. I thought I had the answer, but I don't. Your answer was something with inverting a matrix? No. <laughs> Okay. Linear systems have to do with matrix operations, right? And not the most efficient way to do to solve linear systems because inverting matrices is computationally expensive unless you do it with approximations. But you can see in here this system, uh, I mean, this is pi transpose, that doesn't matter. It comes down if I move pi on the other side as this equation. Everybody knows how to operate with matrices, right? This in here, it's essentially saying 0 is p transpose pi minus pi, which is this. One of the possible solutions, it's obviously pi equals 0. Why is that not a valid solution? Because <coughs> pi has to be a distribution, right? Means what? Sum to 1. Sum to 1. So this is not a distribution. In other words, it will satisfy these equations. If I plug in 0, 0, 0, of course I get 0. But it's not the solution I'm looking for. There is another equation here that I need to have an actual system that I can solve. Which one is that? Somebody else. There's something about pi that makes it a distribution that I need to add to the system. Because those, those equations in linear algebra, we call them linearly dependent. The third one can be obtained from the other two with some manipulations. So we don't, don't need those. Do you have an answer? Um, okay. hmm? Which one is the diagonal matrix? P, you mean diagonalization. Yeah, so th this is not a diagonal matrix. Diagonal matrices have zeros everywhere apart from the diagonal. But there is a decomposition into matrices, like singular value decomposition, for example, that gives you a middle matrix, like a diagonal matrix in there. Those are techniques to solve linear systems. We could do that. For 3 by 3, we don't need such a method, because it's brute force. My point is, I need another equation. This system is too loose. It has many solutions. I need another equation, which is a constraint on pi. Yes. Would it be pi b plus pi n plus pi s equals 1? Yeah. Okay. 
Now, I can keep this one in and can remove one of these three. What, any one of these three is the result of the other two, so I can take it out, and then I have a three by three system that I can actually solve. Either by diagonalization, or by matrix inversion, or by uh, other methods. There are many methods to solve a linear system. This system here, if I have a system that looks x equal some matrix A times, uh, so the, the linear system, just to recap, is x times A equal B. Those are vectors, and that's a matrix. The most direct mathematical way to solve such a system, if A and B are knowns, is to get the inverse of A. Right? If there is an inverse of A, it's very easy. I do x times A times the inverse equal B times the inverse. I multiply with the inverse, which means x equal B times the inverse. If there is an inverse. What's the mathematical property a matrix has to have an inverse? Anybody remembers that? Yes? I, it's either the determinant equals zero, the determinant doesn't Correct. equal zero. The determinant of A has to be not zero to have an inverse. If the determinant is not zero, there's an inverse, and I can just get that inverse, multiply on the right side, I get X out of it. This is not a good solution, especially in practice. In math, it works out. It's on paper. It's exact. It's correct. But if you do data science, you don't want to multiply with inverses when you have a data matrix, because those matrix are very big. The determinant is not zero, but it will be close to zero, makes it extremely unstable. This is not an efficient way to solve systems. That's why people have developed many other ways to solve linear systems. But I can think about this, so I can do this, and I can get my equation, or I can do a substitution, or diagonalization, or any kind of factorization of a matrix will result in a solution for solving the system. In fact, I have here this stuff. Uh, the linear system, in my case, will be pi b equal 0 0.7, uh, pi b plus 0 0.3 uh, pi m plus 0.3 pi s, pi m is 0.2 pi m um, b, right? 0.6 pi m plus 0.2 pi s. You guys can solve this by substitution, and for that problem we had there, I'm getting uh, pi uh, b equal one half, pi m equal uh, one third, and pi uh, s equal one six. I hope you remember how to do substitution. You extract pi b from here, from this equation, right? You plug in this pi b in there, and then two by two now, and then keep going. Uh, you can do this for small systems, but once it becomes like 10 by 10, substitution is not a feasible method anymore. Computers have many, many uh, algorithms very efficient to solve linear equations. MATLAB is the king of linear algebra. It can do a lot of things very well, including the pseudo inverse. If you really want to do the inverse, you should call something that's called a pseudo inverse that has some properties that doesn't get very big or very small numbers, which could happen in an exact sense if the equation is unstable. So math, MATLAB for most of this stuff will use something called pseudo inverses that are much better for computation, even though they are a little bit approximated. One more thing about this. For people who are really into linear algebra, this equation, my pi that I'm looking for is p times pi. I can read as pi times 1 equal p times pi. I look a little bit at geometry. 
So this is something that maybe you hear for the first time. Usually when I take a vector and I multiply with the matrix, I'm changing its direction. <coughs> so you can think of any number like a vector, any set of three, you know, like a geometrical vector. If, if you think about it, when you multiply with the matrix, you very often change the direction of that vector. Also the size, but definitely the direction. So if you, if you think about it this way, in a 3D space, this is my axis. This is my vector here, pi bar. It has three coordinates, right? Pi bar B, pi bar M, and pi bar S, which are those coordinates, B, M, and S. When I multiply, usually, vectors with matrices, I'm getting another vector, say that's pi bar multiplied by a P, right, on the left side. What this equation is saying, pi bar equal P transpose times pi bar, I'm gonna say times one, this multiplication does not change direction of pi bar because the direction remains the same. It also doesn't change the size. If you look about what this equation says, by multiplying with this matrix, the vector resulted has the same direction, meaning it's on the same line, right? Direction means the same line. Size is where on that line the vector is. This is a very special case. The vectors that are not rotated or they not change the direction when you multiply over the matrix, they're very special vectors. They depend on that matrix. Every matrix has some very, very particular vectors that when you apply the matrix to them, they don't change direction. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? What are the vectors that have this property? Because usually if you pick a vector on a matrix and you multiply them, you change the direction of the vector. There are only very few special vectors that don't change direction when you multiply them with that matrix. What vectors are those? Is it an eigenvector? Correct. Not change direction, pi star has to be an eigenvector of matrix P. The, the reason they're eigenvectors, because that's the definition of eigenvectors. Eigenvectors of a matrix are the vectors that when you multiply that matrix to them, they don't change direction. In other words, what does eigenvector mean? Of matrix A in general, it means when I multiply with A, I get the same, how do I say same direction? It's something, a scalar, because I can change the size. I can make the vector bigger or smaller. I'm allowed times x, right? So multiplying with a matrix remains on the same line. Every multiplication with a scalar remains on the same line. To change the direction, you have to multiply with a matrix, right? I don't know how much geometry we remember from the past. These are very special vectors that they don't change direction. They only change size. They call eigenvector. And this here, this scalar, that's the corresponding scalar, it's called? Eigenvalue. So what eigenvalue I have here? The eigenvalue corresponding to this vector is who? Is this one, right? So I can recharacterize the whole thing as saying, who's my stationary distribution? The stationary distribution is the eigenvector of this matrix corresponding to an eigenvalue of 1. And this, this uh, matrix will always have an eigenvalue of 1. Why is that? Why is guaranteed that this transition matrix, the, the first eigenvalue is 1? It's columns sum to one. I know I, I went a little bit too fast, too far in here, okay? 
But this is something you guys gonna need. If you do, it's not all computer scientists need eigenvectors, but if you a little bit touch anything with mathematics, data science, you name it, sooner or later, you're gonna need eigenvalues. There's no big problem if you don't know them right now. But I'm telling you, this is coming and it's almost unavoidable. I mean, if you do web programming nonstop and nothing else, maybe you can get out of the eigenvalues. But most likely, most of you will sooner or later have to deal with eigenvalues. Certainly the ones math inclined or math majors or anything like that. So you have to know for a matrix, it has eigenvalues and eigenvectors. This matrix has to have an eigenvalue of one because it's, it's column sum to one. Therefore, it has an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue of one. That eigenvector is the stationary matrix uh, distribution that we need for this matrix. Um, can we find eigenvectors and values efficiently? Yes. And very efficiently. Um, In fact, eigenvectors, eigenvalues, it's a good way to represent the matrix for all kinds of operations. Like internally, a program like MATLAB even if you give it a matrix, will immediately represent it in two or three ways, so that for whatever operation comes next. Because if you have a matrix decomposed, and di there's different factorizations, one based on eigenvectors. If you have it written that way, things like multiplications, inverses, and you know all kinds of other operations become much more efficient than actually do it the brute force way. So yes, there's efficient ways to obtain the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And there's a lot of theory about how many eigenvalues, what they correspond to, so on and so forth. A lot of approximation of large matrices have to do with an eigenvalue decomposition and reducing all small eigenvalues to zero. That's how PCA works. <coughs> you do an eigenvalue decomposition, you say, what are the reasonably big 10 eigenvalues? Keep those in place, the other ones make them zero, and now my, my matrix has been reduced of 10 by 10 because I approximated the small eigenvalues to zero and I got an approximative 10 by 10 matrix to the one I had. Again, maybe I went too fast, too far. As I said, this is for the ones that are inclined. There's no shame in saying, I never heard of eigenvectors in my life before. I'm just telling you that's coming. So the fast way to solve this, if you can, is to take the matrix, do the eigenvalue decomposition, look at the eigenvector that corresponds to eigenvalue of one, that's the one that you need. Another way to get this is to solve the linear system. And another very inefficient way to get this distribution is by doing this many times, right? That's the Quartzman stationary distribution. Start with a uniform pi zero, multiply with p, and look, hey, is it constant? Is it changing? No, okay, <coughs> multiply again, multiply again, until you see that's not changing anymore. You may have to do millions of multiplications there. And when you do, you say, okay, it's not changing anymore. That pi has to be the stationary distribution. There is a little speed up here. Can we speed this up? Instead of doing one by one those multiplications, is there something we learned that we can speed it up? Instead of say I want k up to a million, do I really have to multiply with p a million times? Repeated squaring. I can do repeated squaring to get there faster. And even if I beat the million, that, does, that doesn't bother me because once it's convergent, it's gonna, it's gonna remain the same. So is it ever guaranteed? No. Often it reaches the stationary distribution. In any natural, practical situation, you don't have to worry about. There are theoretical cases when it doesn't. Things like I have two states from here to here is probability one, from here to here is probability one. That's just, I know exactly after 25 days I'm going to be in the other state. So that's called periodicity. In a very unlikely case that the Markov chain is periodic, it may not have a stationary distribution. But if you pick a natural thing like a weather pattern, there's no way to get a periodic Markov chain or a chess game. There's too many states with too many transitions. So there are two properties that you need to look into. Periodicity to make sure it's not periodic. And irreducibility, that's another property that governs the theory. But the good news is, in most situations, those two <coughs> things will not be an issue. Right? If you have enough states with enough transitions, very likely you get a convergent stationary distribution chain. So, what about page rank? What's up with page rank? 
how does Google apply this whole idea to web pages? Google said, okay, the transition, here's a state, this is the current state. This is the next state, say page. This is a web page, right? Google said, okay, I'm gonna assume the users are following links. Like they don't retype the URL. They are on a page, chances are they click on a link on that page. So what's the chance of moving from here to here? A random user, which again never happens in reality, Google says it's gonna click on random link on the page they're on. So if the page has 25 links, they're gonna pick one at random. Okay, so what's the chance? If this page has 25 links going out, What's the chance of picking this one? One over number of links. Let's say out links. So that's how Google computed this transition matrix. In reality, it's not that uniform. Why? Because often a page could have three or four links to another page. So it has 25 unique or 25 total links, but out of those 25, three of them are to that page, one to that page six of them to the other page. Often you saw that, right? There's on the same page, there's multiple links to the same exact other page. So even if there's 25 things to click on, there's only like nine different pages you can go, and the problem is that not uniform. If there are three links to this page, this will be three over number of links. That's making the unrealistic assumption that users click things at random. I don't know anybody who does that. The clicks at random, but both do that. A lot of the crawlers and a lot of bots that are implemented, they choose, they they, they, they they look at the links, they click one at random. So if you really want to implement a random bot that crawls the internet, that visits all kinds of things to check the pages, check the you know content and, and index the content, which Google needs to do, then this might go at random. And then, what is Google interested in overall page rank? Is this stationary distribution? That is, over time, once everything is said and done, when everybody, Google has not a million users, agents like we have at restaurants, but they have hundreds of millions, maybe billions of bots and users on the web graph. The stationary distribution of this page X is the importance value, global importance. <coughs> of page <coughs> X, and Google calls that page rank. Notice that this is independent of the content of the page. There are many retrieval algorithms that Google and many other companies are using that look at the content. Like if I type a query, is this query related to whatever's on that page? And those are taken into account, of course, because when you type a page, you usually expect to get the page that contains stuff related to what, you, what your query is. But this page rank has nothing to do with the content of the page. Independent of page content. There are other factors like content, but the page rank alone only depends on what? On the links <coughs> between the pages. The actual page rank formula is like this transition probabilities formula. So it's gonna be the sum for all pages y that point to x, right? <coughs> of what? Of page rank of y, how important y is, that is y in here, times what? Probability of transition from who to who? So it's a sum over all pages y, where the user can move from y to the page x. x is the page of interest, y is all other pages where the user can be. I look at all this page rank, that's how important the pages are, and I multiply this probability, which is, we said, typically one over number of out links, 
of y. So if y has, or, or the how many outlinks go to x. So you notice that this, the same like uh, my equation here, it's kind of a recursive equation. This pi and this page rank, it's not something that's kind of on both sides. Page rank of x depends of page rank of y, so I need to deal with it in a recursive fashion. And to complicate things further, Google said, wait a minute, some users just close their browsers and start again. Like they, they don't go to links. So it's more complicated than this. It's uh, how about, this is the sum here. It's 85% this plus 15% just random probability of x. Meaning, what's the chance that at random, somebody just jumps to x? Right? So there is a chance to move from wherever you are to x governing this <coughs> trans transition, just like we did for Markov chains. And there's a 15% to close your browser or just go to a URL window and just type uh, that address. Of course, this probability is very small, right? The chance of moving randomly to a page, given that there are so many pages, it's, it's not uniform. You're more likely to go to Facebook or Microsoft or Apple than to a random page, but still, chance of random teleportation is much smaller than chance to, say, following a Wikipedia link, for example. A lot of this is done in a course called information retrieval, that there is an undergraduate version, grad version. Uh, theoretical notions about this are done more like in, in algorithms courses or in data science courses. So information retrieval will teach you about crawling and bots and how they work on the internet, including PageRank, and what the impact of PageRank has in Google's rankings. Tell you the truth, it's more of a PR thing. The, the reason Google got so popular and so used is not because of PageRank. That's what they say because it looks so good. See, I, I come up with this new idea. It's an algorithm. It's fancy. Everybody's like, wow, that's nice. But that's not why Google became so popular. It was more like a, a, a marketing, uh, you know, stunt a little bit. So that's what I have about PageRank. I want to show you something that uh, you can... Um, you can do at home. I'm going to post it online. Um, just to show how to to show you how to use it. Uh, again, quite useful for people to go into probabilities and statistics, assuming this stuff works. We'll only take a second. I see the projector on, but not. <laughs> something over. But I don't seem to get any signal. Hmm? Try checking in the system and the display is available. No, no, the projector not is this ah, yeah. So what I want to show you a little bit, I have a MATLAB code that you're going to play with it at home if you want. Uh, I want to run it here for you. This is a piece of code that um, uh, does a bunch of simulations. So if you can see here, I'm rolling one die. Uh, this is a version of not uniform. This is related to the previous lecture with replacement 100 times. 
So every time I roll it, I get a histogram of what rolls actually happen. So it's a simulation of reality. Suppose I really roll a die. This is a computer die. It rolls much better than an actual die, because an actual die doesn't have that uniform probability. But while I'm measuring here, every time I press the key, I, I, I get the counts. Uh, I think the green ones, or the blue ones, are the, the green ones are the latest counts, latest 100 batch, and the total bar is the cumulative counts. You can see at the top, so far I, I rolled this die 900 times, right? And, uh, and I get here estimated mean, estimated standard deviance, that's the square root of variance, remember? And uh, the entropy. So I can roll this die many, many, many times, and this bar, what is this bar, the red bar in there? That's the estimated mean. Estimated mean variance and entropy are empirical estimations, are not the same like the theoretical ones. Of course, if I roll it many times, they become equal. The estimated mean, once I roll it enough times, would be exactly 3.5. There's a low large numbers that governs that. You can't get a mean far away from the theoretical mean if you roll that many times. And I have all kinds of, uh, all kinds of rolls here. For example, I have uh, uh, 600 integers that are extremes. Like the distribution is not uniform of these integers. They, they um, the mean of these integers is designed to be that, 76 or so, and then the roll of the die is simulating from a distribution. If you look at the code, there is a distribution built in, in there that generates the, the simulation. Um, I have other things you can play with. I think you have coin flips in here. Yeah. So here's a coin toss that's, that's biased towards the heads. It's not a fair 50-50, and uh, I roll it. Uh, of course, in a coin, I can only get heads and tails, right? So there's two columns. This is bi bi biased towards the heads, so I'm going to get more heads. Every time I, I roll this coin, flip the coin, I'm going to get heads, tails, heads, tails. <coughs> so this is quite useful if you have a complex distribution. For simple distributions, we can compute those things theoretically right away, mean, variance, so and so forth. But if you have a very complicated distribution, you are, I don't know, an auto dealer, you have so many brands, so many models, and you want to simulate what's going to happen. You can empirically get those mean, variance, and entropy without having to know all kinds of statistics. So here, another one that I have is um, integers, um, uniform integers. I think they have, this is a uniform mean. I want to show you something. Here's the midterm grades, <laughs> right? The median was about 76. This is a distribution of the grades. For everybody who complained the class is too hard, look at those grades. <laughs> How can it be so hard if we look at where this is the histogram, the y-axis is how many of those values I've seen, right? So look at the, how many 80s and 90s and 100 versus how many 20s and 30s. I don't think it was that hard, right? This is from last year, though. It's not really yours. But you guys, you guys did the same. The distribution didn't change. So you can take this code, and actually for people who are into math, you can uh, look at the code. The code is here that does all the sampling from these distributions. So you can play with it. That's where we're going to stop. I hope this class is going to be useful. I have one more comment for you guys. Because you are freshmen, I make this comment all the time. It's not what the administration wants me to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Many people along the way will tell you what to do. Do this, study that. What I do is the most important. Math, something, distribution, graphs. Your parents are going to say, do that. Your girlfriend, do that. Your grandmother, do that. Everybody's going to have an opinion. At some point, you have to take the time and think, what do I actually want to do? There is a value in settling down and with your own head decide, you know what, I think this is for me.
even though if everybody tells me that's not it, I mean, you should pay attention to what people say. There is a reason why people say you're making a mistake. You probably make a mistake. <laughs> but there is a value in following what you actually want to do. So no matter how important math is or computers are or other things in your life, at some point you gotta think for a second, what is that I really want to do here? And I had this discussion with some of you on an individual basis. If you really like math, because that's the subject we're talking about now, it's not gonna be easy to fit in your time. Math takes time, but it's extremely rewarding. So my experience, personally, I grew up in a different culture, different country, so on and so forth, was easy for me. I just study math that I like and I ignore the other things. <laughs> I get failed grades, I get bad grades, and I particular professors are very upset with me because they knew I can do it, but I miss all the classes for that course. You know? I, I say it worked fine, so I, I don't say you should do that. <laughs> you can't miss classes in this culture and this country. It's That's impossible to, to, to yeah. just fail everything. They don't do that. But you should follow it into your heart. If your heart is at eigenvectors and eigenvalues, <laughs> <laughs> to fit this in, I'm talking about you too. You know, even though you're gonna miss some things along the way, it's a, it's a, it's a compromise you have to make sometimes. I mean, long term, it's extremely valuable to do something that you want to do, to not get stuck into okay. This is what the schedule is. This is what everybody does. This is what the recipe is. Everybody follows that recipe. And you can get miserable that way. I'm not saying you, sh you will. I'm saying take a moment and evaluate if math is something really of interest to you. Because if it is, you're going to have to put time into it serious time. This is a very intro, washed out course of mathematics. But you can see how from here, there are interesting ramifications or where, where you might want to go, especially for people who consider theory or PhDs. And that's not a small number anymore. Out of you, you know, 30, 40% will end up with graduate studies and will end up with research. Math is an extreme foundation for research. Almost nothing in research works today without mathematics. That's it from me. I'm going to see some of you. later on. Um, tomorrow we can play poker if you come to, to the office hours. <laughs> Instead of your yeah. Was it fun? Yes. Would you wish you were being a regular section? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure some of you do regret going in the other section just they're not honest, they don't want to admit it. I know I can 
You know, as someone who's not very good at that, it wasn't that. Yeah, that's true. I feel. Yeah. I feel. Yeah. Well, our job here was to push the boundary a little bit. Yeah. As opposed to the regular section who doesn't push the boundary, their, their main job is to make sure everybody has the minimum requirements to go to, not to make the mathematician. Our job here was to, okay, let's see how much you take a little bit, give you a feel. Like at this point, some of you will decide, okay, math is definitely for me. Probably some of you knew that. And some of you will decide, okay, how much exactly should I put into it? Like how much resources, time, and energy will take to get through what I want to get through? Computer science, economics, physics, other things. You know, so at some point you have to evaluate, okay, I can't do all these proofs and all that, it's not for me, but how much do I need and what pieces do I need to make right. it work? For like data science would need some of that. You can't get data science without being algebra properties, so on and so forth. I mean math majors will have to decide, you know, still how much math they do. Yeah, they give me the second kit, but that's okay. I think that's for everybody to decide, yeah. maybe not right away, but eventually. Yeah. You know. Definitely. Keep in mind that math will take time for anybody, whether you are very good at it or you know you're just starting or you're thinking. The math will take time, so inevitably it will be a compromise between math and the rest of your life. Uh, it's very rewarding, like I said. Like for me it worked out. I ignore a bunch of things and I study more math and I'm very happy I did so. But um, it will take time from other things. The, the theory being that's mostly understood now, especially in the eastern side of the world. If you learn math early on in your life, because I'm assuming you are 20 something, so you have you know, 50 years ahead of you, it's a good foundation for whatever may come. You know, if you're not good at, say, Java, probably you can learn Java quite fast if you have to. But if you're not good at math and you have to, that could be a big problem. You can't do math really quick. So most people believe in the Eastern cultures that once you put the math as a foundation, everything could follow through. You know, you can't put it very late, but young ages, if you put the math in, you can speed up the others. The other guys in the performance, are you going to ask you about the law of large numbers and why you think it can wait? I don't know. It has to anything about it. Yeah, so it has to do with, uh, yeah, sure. It has to do with, uh, you know, once you average things a lot. Conceptually, I totally get it, but the problem in this textbook is that they have, they point out the second part of the, they're like, here is a EPM, I'm sorry, it's written all over. Oh, that's the information theory book? Yeah, it's a, exactly as great as you said it would be. Mm -hmm. And they basically say in their proof that the probability of existence like of, a, of a specific um, observation of a bunch of samples being within like the normal set. They just say that it So I can't do this now. This will take more than five minutes. We can do it at office hours today or meet after. I'm happy to meet with you. I don't know if Thursday I can make it in, but I'll definitely sit down and debug this with you. Okay. I can't do it right now in class. I, uh, this will take uh, an hour. You know. um, I'll try to come into office hours tonight. Yeah. Um, so that's great. Uh, I'll have to give priority to the homework first. So I'll go in. Yeah, no, I figured. Let's see how people do the homework. Is it really hard, the homework? No. no. I'm horrible at probability. It makes no sense to me. So it's so, quite hard for me. So I'm going to go there. Maybe you don't want to show up at, at 6. Come at 7. I don't know. It's an ISIC, right? Yeah. I guess, yeah. OK. But maybe you should take the time to talk about this at some point later. That would be, yeah. I don't know, you know, maybe the homework is hard. Yeah, we'll get through it. I, I show him this book about information theory. It's the textbook. So it's the books you've studied in a course. Um, I, have, I wanted to get all the way through this as well. So I might wait. Yeah. Um, I might just wait yeah, and sure. get, like, talk to you another time so we can talk about both. Sure. Either way, uh, you guys want to ask me anything? You, you were waiting for me. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, and uh, I really enjoyed the course despite not liking